In this lecture, we'll survey historical and literary context for Robert Murphy's The Silent Body. We've talked before about grotesque realism in this class. There are many different kinds of realism, social realism, psychological realism, surrealism, and grotesque realism. Recall that the most important underlying tenet of all these is that each strives to give a faithful representation of reality, whatever they believe that reality to be, or whatever part of reality they're focusing on. Each type of realism defies other aesthetic styles and movements by insisting that it represents what is most real, whether it be social inequities, psychological abnormalities, or disconnects between the subconscious and conscious mind. Realism in general is a reaction against Romanticism, an earlier movement which realists criticized as being irresponsibly idealized, symbolic, and disconnected from reality. Realists argued that Romantic literature encourages socially unjust and immoral behaviors, Think, for instance, of the criticisms we might have today against chivalric codes of conduct. Such idealizing of women and limited parameters for achieving honor may encourage sexist and otherwise toxic behaviors. So as a whole, realism sets out to present a more socially or culturally responsible literature. Grotesque realism goes so far as to criticize not just the idealizations of romanticism, but the larger, underlying, often unspoken classical tenet of humanism, which is the ideal belief in the nobility, the beauty, truth, and goodness of humankind. So, if we go as far back as the works of classical antiquity, then we're dealing with perspectives of human beauty as symmetrical, balanced, linear, strong. Think of your typical statue of a Greek soldier or a Greek god. Grotesque realism confronts the reality of the human body that classical and romantic art does not, that is, the hairy, the wet, the putrid, the odorous, the porous, the clammy, and so forth. Grotesque realism degrades that which was originally abstract and spiritual to a material level, or the level of nature. While grotesque realism isn't one of the major kinds of realism that end up being introduced in most class discussions, it is a telling symptom of an important moment in time when we witness a paradigm shift in our thinking, from viewing not just us but the world as spiritual, ruled by religious beliefs and godly truths, to viewing the world and us as simply animals, brutes of nature, or simply natural objects, as revealed by science, the only truths being those that come of the material, bodily experiences, and natural law. Thus, grotesque realism exhibits the grotesqueness of the body, its dissonance or incongruity between the idea of noble human and the reality of the ignoble body. It focuses on the body's primary needs to eat, drink, fight, and have sex. Such incongruity has specific effects on readers. We might feel shock, and thus unexpectedly estranged from the material, causing us to rethink the content at a more conscious level than we normally would. This is typical of early 20th century literature, which in the face of mass productionism, commodified art, and widely disseminated governmental propaganda, tried to make readers more politically conscious and responsible citizens. The incongruities of grotesque realism can also elicit humor. Now, humor can serve several different roles in literature and art. Humor can establish in-groups and out-groups, or classes of superiority and inferiority. For example, the inside joke allows you to establish an exclusive in-group that may or may not in actuality be elite, but which regardless allows participants to feel superior due to their possession of special knowledge, which those not in the know do not have. This is called the superiority theory of humor. Humor can be relieving. This theory of humor, the relief theory, goes back to Freud and the idea that there is content and feelings that we must repress. Humor allows the expression of those otherwise repressed feelings and taboo subjects. For instance, allowing healing after a traumatic event, catastrophe, or death. Carnivalesque culture, like Mardi Gras, is an example of this kind of expressive, riotous feeling, allowing participants to revel in behaviors and actions that are not typically acceptable outside of the festival period. The carnivals of Renaissance time after which Mardi Gras is fashioned likewise allowed lower and middle class individuals to critique the upper classes or mock them without fear of reprisal. Finally, humor can be incongruous, eliciting an intellectual rather than emotional response, much like the estrangement effect mentioned earlier. Besides being an aesthetic of incongruous content, then, grotesque realism is an aesthetic of incongruous effects. If feeling rather than intellect is involved, it tends towards the emotional responses of disgust and pity. Pity is a relatively simple feeling that most of us understand. It's sympathy tinged with sadness, which is why pity can so often feel pejorative or degrading. While sympathy usually implies a level of equality, to say we feel sad for someone is potentially condescending. Disgust is one of the six basic emotions identified as present across diverse cultures. The other primary emotional states include fear, anger, sadness, happiness, and surprise.
For a basic definition, we can consider disgust to be our response to something distasteful or offensive. Like other emotions, it's not just an abstract feeling, but has bodily reactions, including reduced heart rate, reduced blood pressure, reduced respiration rate, lower skin temperature, increased salivation, and increased gastrointestinal movement, leading to feelings of nausea and vomiting. Disgust is particularly recognizable for its well-defined facial expression called gaping, which again we see across different cultures. Gaping involves the furrowed eyebrow, wrinkled nose, retracted upper lip, and lowering of the corners of the mouth. Gaping may even include the classical tongue extension, which has actually been observed across a number of animals, including birds and mammals. The reason for such a distinctive physiological expression of disgust is evolutionary and biological. At its root, disgust is a defensive response, originally associated with the sense of taste to reject or eject offensive tasting foods or other substances from the mouth and or stomach. This protects animals from ingesting potentially harmful substances, promoting disease and toxin avoidance. Disgust isn't limited to the gaping expression either. Faced with a subject of disgust, you might close your eyes, look away, plug your nose, or in the most extreme cases, remove yourself from the situation, increasing your distance from the offending matter. However, disgust is not just a biological and physiological response. It is cultural and sociological. Consider the following, for instance. Are all cultures disgusted by the same things? And are we disgusted by the same things our whole life? The first question is easy to answer when we think about the foods of different cultures. What may be tantalizing and appealing in one culture may be appalling and incomprehensible in another. The second answer is a little more layered. We might look to children versus adults as one set of examples showing how disgust can change over a lifetime. A child unafraid of feces or recalcitrant in the face of vegetables is not the, hopefully, well-adjusted adult who glories in kale salads yet cringes when dogs sniff other dogs' behinds. Something that never disgusted you at one point in your life may become disgusting at another for purely other physiological reasons. Pregnancy can change a person's preferences and tolerances to certain foods, smells, and tastes. Most importantly, disgust is no longer considered a biological feeling to protect the body against ingesting potentially harmful substances, but rather plays a role in psychology as well. Disgust not only protects the body, but our unique sense of humanity. This could mean that disgust is a psychological defense to protect one's sense of personal integrity or soul. So for instance, people perceived as exhibiting immoral or unacceptable behaviors may elicit psychological disgust. But this list is wide and varied. It can include people who act reprehensibly, they've invaded your space, or they do drugs, just as easily as it can include people who have not behaved in any particular way, but simply represent things that people want to avoid. Thus, a conservative person avoids wearing the sweater offered by his homosexual friend. A victim of rape may be bullied, and acquaintances may feel embarrassed by accidentally bringing attention to a person's illness or disability, for instance, asking a blind person if he or she saw the most recent Marvel movie. It is not necessarily fear of contagion that motivates aversion and avoidance, but rather a desire to avoid any reminders of our human imperfection and frailty. Disgust is an inherent part of the process of socialization, establishing in-groups and out-groups, prejudices, be they against certain races, classes, sexualities, ages, genders, the disabled, etc., all to maintain the integrity of the self. But when disgust becomes self-reflexive or diverted towards the self, a person becomes vulnerable to the onset of emotional disorders. For instance, disgust for food or one's body as overweight and unsightly may lead to anorexia or bulimia. A person who is disgusted with him or herself is typically not only self-loathing, but more prone to depression. We saw a similar all-consuming dysfunctional self-shame earlier in the semester in Sartre's Lulu. A person might exercise avoidance strategies in order to cope with particular characteristics about him or herself. So for instance, a person with a physically apparent illness or disability may avoid mirrors or activities that reveal their bodies, such as going to the beach, or they might compensate for their perceived abnormality or lack by overachieving in other areas, by becoming a social or political leader, exercising entertainment skills such as comedic behavior, or focus efforts on intellectual endeavors. This week and next week, we'll be reading the pathography of a man with a disability, and we'll see the gamut of disgust responses in himself and between him and others. But before we get there, I want to cover one last thing. Is disability an identity? This is similar to the question of whether gender, race, and sexuality count as identities, so the answer seems clear. Yes, having a disability can be an identity, but identities that are frequently treated with disgust or pity that are 
othered by those identified as having the hegemonic body type, the hegemonic body type being whatever is culturally desired, white, skinny, blonde, etc., can overwhelm a person's other identities. To be clear, all of our identities are comprised of multiple facets. Audre Lorde is black, woman, gay, mother, and poet. Never just one of these things, but all of them all at once. Recognizing the connectedness of one's multiple identities in race, gender, class, and so forth is called intersectionality. But sometimes, dependent on the values of society, a person may be identified with a single identity. For instance, an obese man may be identified as simply the fat guy, regardless of his other interests and characteristics. Such a primary identifying characteristic is called a master status. Master statuses have exceptional importance in a person's social life and often shapes a person's entire life. How this sociological concept coincides with literature is interesting since disabled bodies have traditionally filled the role of villains. Think, for instance, of Shakespeare's hunchbacked Richard III or any number of fictional characters with missing legs, eyes, or hands that have fulfilled the role of the bad guy. And if disabled bodies are not filling such nefarious roles, they're often forgotten. It's only recently that main characters or even supporting characters include those with disabilities of various sorts. Think Geordie LaForge from Star Trek, Artie Abrams from Glee, or Tyrion Lannister from Game of thrones. Traditionally, characters who do not fit into cultural meta-narratives are presented as background figures. You're not white or black, but mixed and thus forgotten. You're not heterosexual or homosexual, but bisexual and thus not represented. You're not healthy nor on your deathbed, and so you sit on the sidelines. I call these characters the in-betweens. Disability studies rethinks the representation of such figures, and in this way we can see how disabilities have appeared throughout literature as empowering even before we began having literature and media with wider representation. Medusa, for instance, the woman whose looks can kill anyone who laughs at her, and sirens, disfigured bodies of brass that nonetheless sing beautifully, are examples of beauty, art, and power found in disabled bodies. As the late 20th century Welsh national poet Gwyneth Lewis says, every disease is a work of art if you play it rightly.